to um, introduce and welcome each other. Okay. And, um, and then uh, um, t right now and then also um, later this evening at the closing party, um, we'll be reflecting back um, some of what they have heard and observed and synthesized um, from the conversations taking place during the ConFest. Um, so please welcome Andrea Asaf, uh, who will explain more. Good morning, y'all. How you doing today? Are you awake yet? No. No, okay. So hopefully we'll wake you up. Um, so we're going to share a reflection um, that we made in yesterday's workshop. Uh, and we made it by... Um, talking about some conversations and themes and things that we've been hearing and then identifying those themes and then connecting a little bit of uh, personal stories and personal relationships to those themes and then we made some material and we shared it and we did this super super fast this is like devised theater on speed okay y'all so you will see me conducting because we haven't really had rehearsal time we have instead a structure and some bits of stories and reflections we want to share and we're just gonna um, roll with it if y'all are cool with that yeah, yeah. all right so please welcome the device theater workshop
tell them. Don't ever turn it off. That's our lives. Um, uh, Leilani, Leilani, and somebody else. Who's the somebody else? Rand Randy, Randy, my brother. No, no, my son. Sorry, my son. Randy and Leilani, please come on up because they have a little announcement. I have a lot of sons here. I, I hate to say this, but where is Leilani? <laughs> she, she left me. Um, that's this is trickery. <laughs> Trickery. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Randy Reyes, uh, uh, artistic director of Move Performing Art, also board member of Kata. And uh, we're here to, um, we, last night at the open mic, we started, we passed around, um, a, a, I don't know what it was, a big bowl that had handles on it. Um, that's not important. Uh, but the important part is that we were uh, acknowledging that this costs money to do, and it's actually amazing what, um, what Gail has been able to do on the budget that, that yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? It was a dental floss budget, and to create this amazing um, event around that was, was unbelievable. So we want to get into the practice of giving, um, giving money and uh, the idea that we're not afraid to ask for money and that, that, that there's a reality of, of that and philanthropy is, is great. Um, so we're, pa and Leilani is still not here, which is awesome, but we're gonna have a bag. And I think it's gonna be a Kung Fu zombie bag. Um, and uh, if you put money in there, you can actually have a, another bag. There's a lot of Kung Fu zombie bags, I guess. So. Uh, <laughs> And so if you see us hanging out uh, with a bag, just put money in, in it. <laughs> um, and then we'll be able to do this again in two years, bigger and better. Yeah. If I was a bag. <laughs> put it in there, go ahead. Oh, but don't let it pop. Yay! The future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yes, Randy was a bag man from the, his drug days. But, but uh, OK, so I'd like to start our panel. So if we can um, have our plenary panelists come on up and have a seat. Um, I just want to uh, make sure you know where you're at. This is the plenary on casting and representation. And I know uh, we've had issues and events and things around the country. And I feel like uh, these panelists are people who have been involved intimately with all those uh, events and, and situations, and I'd like them to be speaking to some of them so to give us a sense of the larger picture and maybe some ideas for how to deal with issues and how to move forward. So um, I'm just going to start with uh, having them sort of do a one-minute self-introduction um, so that we can, you can have a sense of who's here. Hi there, I'm Pun Bandu. I'm an actor. Uh, I've been an a, a professional actor now for 13 years. I graduated from the Yale School of Drama. I got, did my training there. And um, since then, I've uh, been on Broadway two seasons ago in WIT. Uh, I've, I've done off-Broadway theater. I've worked with all of the Asian American theater companies in New York. Um, and uh, <coughs> uh, I've done regional work. I'm actually going out of town to do a show in Baltimore in two weeks, and um, TV and film. Uh, I actually have, it was a great scene that's been slashed down to one line in The Judge, which is opening this, this weekend. And I guess I should also say that I, I'm a founding member of the Asian American Performers Action Coalition in New York, APAC, um, and what, oh, thank you. You guys have heard about us. We've been, we've been quoted in the, uh, the Commons blogs that, were, that started out this, this conference, um, as well as you know, our statistics are out there um, and has really made a huge difference in terms of raising awareness uh, in terms of the, the inequities that exist in the casting process out there. I'm still Randy, and uh, I actually uh, just, as my second year as artistic director of Moo after 20, one years of a leadership and a founding leadership by Rick Shiomi. So uh, I am here today because of Rick and, uh, and his legacy. Um, I actually, I trained at the Juilliard School and, and started as an actor. Uh, after I 
gra when I graduated from Juilliard, I was a white actor. Um, I did, uh, <laughs> and I quickly realized that I was not um, as I started to audition. And uh, and I didn't get to my I didn't come to my Asian American part of my artistry until I came to Minneapolis, ironically. Um, just because I went from New York, which has a lot of more Asians than in Minneapolis, but actually that's the place where I, I, I found my identity um, through the work that I've done with Moo. Um, so that's where I am today. I came out white, now I'm yellow, and, uh, and I'm proud of it, and I'm so excited to. So I came through this whole identity or Asian, being Asian American later in my life. Um, and I don't have the amazing, um, the, the language, the, the way that Leslie is able to talk about, about the, the systems and liberating ourselves and colonization, um, but I, I care a lot about it. Caring matters at first, that's great. Hi, I'm Leslie Ishii, uh, stage director, actor, and arts educator. I've been affiliated probably a little over 20 years now with East West Players. Uh, most recently with artists that play in Los Angeles primarily. Um, I'm a teaching artist with East West Players now for a little over 20 years and also uh, the past six seasons with Center Theater Group. I've implemented uh, a new works program, the API 2x2 two two New Works Program at Oregon Shakespeare Festival just this last August. So you can look for more there and to up our representation there and visibility, and have also uh, supported in the co-facilitation and launch of the Diversity and Inclusion Institute with Theater Communications Group. Um, I trained at the American Conservatory Theater, and actually that's when I started knowing Rick Shiomi back in the day in the Bay Area, and before he was in Minneapolis. And uh, like Randy, I was probably one of the only Asians that graduated from a major program that year. So uh, it was a very lonely time, but, uh, and, and a very whitewashed kind of training. Uh, but I've been in recovery ever since. <laughs> <laughs> proudly, proudly so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Middledorf. Um, I am also, I, I'm sort of in the midst of figuring out my Asian American identity and, and beginning to grapple with it. I self-identified as white until probably about a year and a half ago. Um, and I appreciate you sort of opening that conversation because it was something that I felt like I wanted to mention before going into my talk that I feel like I'm really learning and I'm really in a process right now. And I really appreciate all the people that have been going through that with me. Um, I am a Philadelphia-based director, that's why I'm here. Um, but I majored in linguistics, so there we go. Great, thank you. So um, uh, we can see this tremendous range and, and, and uh, talent pool that we have here uh, and experience. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, Pun because, um, because of his work with APAC and, and uh, hopefully he will give a, a kind of larger picture of, of the, some of the situations in regards to casting and representation, so. Sure. So um, APAC started as a result of uh, my Facebook feed, actually. I, um, I, I had always wanted to work with Playwrights Horizons, and, um, you know, I finally got my first audition there. And I happened to post, you know, like, I'm excited I've got my first audition at Playwrights Horizons. I'm just surprised that... It took me 10 years to get that first audition. Um, and then that caused this, like, like over 230 comments came flooding in from, you know, not just the Asian American acting community, but, but primarily, like, they were saying, like, yeah, I've never auditioned there either, and I've never auditioned at the Roundabout, I've never auditioned at the Lincoln Center, you know, and this was coming from people who had been acting, like, way long before I had, and some of them were Obie award-winning actors, people that I respected so much, and it, it became clear that there was, that this was endemic. It wasn't just about, you know, one theater. Um, this was uh, systemic of uh, certainly the, the, the New York uh, theater system. And, um, and so 
you know, about 10 other ragtag, rebellious, you know, ragamuffins and I got together, uh, be mostly because the Mayu Theater actually um, gave us, gave, hosted uh, 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 some of us and, and brought us together. And out of that came this group. And we realized that we didn't have the statistics to back up what we were feeling about the fact that, you know, opportunities seem to be getting worse for Asian actors, not better. And, um, you know, publicly available statistics that track stack, uh, to casting was not available. And so we initiated the back-breaking work of actually crunching all of those numbers using publicly available um, uh, resources. And, um, and what we found was really staggering. You know, these statistics have, we didn't realize at the time, but these statistics sort of helped to create so much awareness, not only in New York, but in actions literally all around the world. Um, and, and it really showed that, you know, Asians were so invisible in the New York theater scene. And so um, I guess just to get the conversation started, I'll tell you our latest statistics with, that we have, which is actually from a season and a half ago, the 2012 to 2013 season. Um, actually, there's a lot of good news. In the four years that we've been working, uh, those numbers have risen con consistently. And um, in 2012, 2013, 25% of all available roles went to actors of color. And that is a seven year high. In all the seven years that we have statistics, um, that's, that's been the high. And that's really something to celebrate. Within that, 16% went to African Americans. Um, uh, four percent went to uh, Latinos, and in this year, five percent actually went to Asian Americans, which is huge. That's also a seven-year high. Um, a large part of that came about because uh, this was the season when the Signature Theater did a whole season dedicated to David Henry Huang's plays. This was a theater that the public. This was a season that the public theater did Here Lies Love for the first time. Also, at the New Group, there was a production called Bunty Berman. Uh, a, a South Asian musical. And um, so those numbers largely are a result of three theater companies. So I just wanted to sort of frame that context. Um, and in fact, um, the bad news is that the numbers on Broadway actually decreased in that year. So Asians are only represented at about 2% on Broadway. Um, however, you know, there is, some, there is a lot of good news in that, um, that we had been tracking non-traditional casting numbers as well through the seven years. And they have, for six years in a row, they had historically been state stagnant. Um, and it's, it's actually shocking how few roles in New York City are cast without regard to race. And, um, and they usually hover at sort of the... Um, the nine to 10 percent mark, and that is just to put it in context. That nine or 10 percent is actually the percentage of the 20, 20 to 25 percent of actors of color. So, 10 percent of the the 20 percent. Um, so we're really talking about a handful of actors who were who were cast in roles that were not defined by their race. And of that, um, Asian Americans were the group that were least likely to be able to transcend their race. Um, so that's, that's, that's it within context uh, in terms of the statistics. Uh, the other thing that I would like to say is that you know, another thing that APAC does a lot is that we actually engage with a lot of the theaters um, uh, that we run numbers with. And uh, it's sort of a challenging place to be because, you know, we're challenging and holding accountable theaters where we want to work at, you know, and um, so it is, it is sort of being in, in the middle of a, a rock and a hard place of being able to, to speak our truth um, while seeing their perspective at the same time. And the, the amazing thing, the most eye-opening thing for me going through this, this process is how many people are on our side, you know, like these are allies. These are, you know, even the theater who had the worst numbers, you know, we, we sat and talked with them and were, I was shocked when they said, oh, we, we really believe in non-traditional casting. And I was like, really? Then why aren't your numbers reflecting that? You know, um, and, um, 
and, and, and it's been sort of eye-opening to me to see sort of what progress means within, within uh, that, that there is a lot of the bias that I feel uh, is out there um, occurs as a result of, um, you know, it's a very subtle bias that, that reflects sort of what it is like to be part of a minority, you know, to be a member of minority in that, you know, uh, there is just a belief that, you know, Caucasian actors are, uh, are the standard, you know, that if, if it's a story where race has nothing to do with the story, then by default, um, you're going to cast it, you know, if it's, if it's a non-racially specific role, you're going to think of white actors first. And, you know, and it's, a, it's really interesting, you know, even when I was, we, we were talking with the Casting Society of America, you know, uh, everyone was on board with the idea that the best actor should get the role regardless of race. You know, that was a concept that they were like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, we agree with that. But when, when, when we pushed it further and, and when I said, you know, for instance, you know, Martha in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, there's no reason why, you know, her race is not part of the story being told. There's no reason why she couldn't be an Asian woman. And at that point, there was like a silence in the room, you know, and then there was like, well, you know, would, would Edward Albee be okay with that? You know, and like, you know, doesn't that change the story being told? Because, you know, so it, it really is interesting where people think, you know, it's still interesting to me that race is still so primary as to change the story being told. And it's also interesting when and where roles are allowed to, quote, go a different way. And um, I say that in quotes because I, I really do think that the larger issue here is that it really is this othering process, right, of like, okay, once we have this cast of, you know, 12 people and they've primarily been cast as white, at that point we can think of, you know, maybe opening it up to go a different way, you know? Or, you know, it, it's so rare that <coughs> the lead roles are open for minorities to, to, um, to audition for, much less get cast in. And so, um, you know, what APAC really stands behind is that the best actor should get the role regardless of race. That is the ideal that we hold true because, you know, uh, it's not a reality yet and that's what we're working towards, but uh, that really is at the root of, um, of our right to have access to equal opportunities. Great, thank you. Oh, great, yeah. Uh, thank you, Poon, and he was East Coast, I'll go West Coast. Um, uh, just this last June was the TCG conference where I produced with some other cohorts uh, from the West Coast, specifically California. Um, and Mia was on the panel, Tim Dang, uh, Randy was on our panel, and uh, we had some other artist guests. And it was called Establishing Asian Pacific Islanders in the American Theater based on the fact that I feel that we're not established, that's partly why we have an epidemic of misrepresentation and misappropriation. Uh, I was just sharing with Poon, if we were, you know, th this whole, oh, we transcend, we go to non-traditional casting, we could do it with Shakespeare. I go, but Shakespeare's been established for 400 years, so we can begin to depart and experiment, but we're not even established. So that was the whole uh, theory behind the reasoning behind creating this breakout session. We handed out, I think, nearly 100 whistles so that APIs could symbolically wear them as whistleblowers regarding racism. So I want you to know we made quite an impact at that national conference. And it was a game changer because some of our breakouts were actually hardly uh, attended. And in the fight, what I'm learning, because I produced and had to attend a different conference, uh, what I'm learning is that in the very last plenary, when numerous mission statements were written, or excuse me, I think recited by uh, various repre uh, representatives, uh, there was no native theater represented and there was no API theater represented. And that created a huge uh, kind of firestorm in some of the debrief sessions. 
And I would say, can folks who were at TCG raise their hands? Excellent. For those who weren't, weren't there, please seek them out and learn about what was happening at our largest national conference. You know, TCGs are our largest advocacy group. So please seek them out and, and ask them about the dynamic that happened. It, it was, it's been a game changer. Um, I want to just offer you some statistics from Southern California. Consistent with the APAC New York study, really, five Southern California repertory theaters now only represent 4% API on their stages. And I'm going to name the theaters. That's the Center Theater Group. And this is actually uh, actors, directors, playwrights, composers, lyricists, scenic designers. So Center Theater Group, The Old Globe, South Coast Rep, La Jolla Playhouse, Pasadena Playhouse. And again, 4%. While the US census of API population is 15% in Los Angeles County, 12% in San Diego County, and 20% in Orange County. So you can see uh, how disparaging it is that while we are now majority people of color in California, we're hardly represented. And one of the great things that also began to be launched at the TCG conference was Tim Dang's 51% preparedness plan. And the 51%, or let me go back, the preparedness plan is that, you know, we're in California, we're always prepared for an earthquake. You have your bottles of water, you have your kit, right? So, and Tim, Tim can speak to this further too when we get to opening this up. Um, the idea that we're preparing for 2042 when our nation is predicted to be majority people of color. So basically, we can't wait till 2042, and we're already majority in California. So we've started to launch a 51% in five years plan, and there's certain tenets about knowing that certain areas are um, maybe not uh, uh, POC, demographically heavy, but maybe you could, use, you could employ more women or uh, young people, 35 and under. Um, th so there's a number of ways you can become diverse in five years. Uh, so, and again, I'll refer to Tim on, on the details of that. Uh, so this is a document that I will share with Kata, with Moo, with APAC, Asian Arts uh, uh, Initiative, and any other theater that wants to sign up with me afterward. It's a tool that we put out at the conference it basically uh, gives some of those stats. And we have a huge questionnaire about how you can be season planning, the questions you might ask yourself, play production, and on a personal level, what you can be doing to become an ally and to forward the, all the tenets of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, yeah, to, to be challenging your own bias. And, um, I'll leave you one last thing. Um, I heard a, a radio program on NPR, and it was about innovation. And um, one of the things that was really interesting was it was a woman working for, I believe it was Google. And she was talking about how she was sitting around a table and all the men in this creative think tank were proud of themselves for, for creating this idea for an app where, where you would basically, in your pocket, have your, your cell phone. And if you had this app, it would automatically bump everybody else's cell phone. And you would immediately have their information. Thank you. You'd have their information. So you could instantly network it and, and gather information for further contact. And she piped up and said, uh, wait a minute, I'm a woman, and women actually are the majority on the planet. Um, you have an innovation blind spot. You're missing an entire market. Uh, we don't carry our cell phones in our pockets. We carry them in our purses. We carry them in our computer satchels, do you know? So you really have to look at your innovation blind spots. And in this handout, um, in this document, 
there's some questions to ask about diversity blind spots and how we're perpetuating the lack of diversity, inclusion, and equity. So again, I'll share this document because it's wonderful to have these tools so that you can be challenging with these questions, challenge the normative. And thank you, it's an honor to be on this panel, Rick. Told you she talks really good. <laughs> <laughs> and now me, all right. Um, no. Uh, so I have a, I just have to say I, have, I feel very uh, lucky to be um, working with an Asian American theater company that uh, aren't affected by other, we can do our own work and uh, we can tell the stories we want to tell it the way that we want to tell it and we don't have to answer to anybody, we don't have to wait for anyone's approval, we don't have to and I just feel very lucky, like your story started, I was in New York for 10 years and I, my stomach started to get that feeling of just waiting for people to give me an opportunity. You know, and that's such a helpless feeling and I felt, I've, I've, I've felt that and I'm, I'm just like, I want to produce everyone's play here. You know, I'm, I, I think that, I just feel so lucky that I, that I have that. Um, that said, we, have, we still have our issues. In the Twin Cities, uh, in, in May uh, 2010, um, CTC was producing Mulan, um, the musical. Uh, sorry, yeah, the Children's Theater. It's, we call it CTC. Oh, you guys are not, okay. Yeah, uh, the Children's <laughs> Theater Company, in the, which is one of the largest children's company in the country, has a, a budget, um, annual budget of uh, 13 million. Um, was doing a Disney uh, Mulan and, uh, and one of our actors who works with Mu a lot came and said during, during the rehearsal process, audition process, realizing that they were going to cast a couple of the main characters as white um, and wanted, wanted some guidance um, of how to go forward with uh, being part of a, of a play uh, that where um, white people were going to be playing Asian characters, um, and uh, and so this was when Rick was uh, the artistic director. Um, we decided to have a conversation with the artistic director of uh, the Children's Theater, Peter Brocious, and uh, say, "What's going on? Why why are you doing this? Why don't you cast it all Asian? You have an opportunity here. Um, more importantly, you're a children's theater, and uh, and children are going to see this." a play about uh, a, an Asian story and the lead male character is going to be white. What is that going to say about um, this, about our culture, that even our men look white? Um, so we thought that there was a, there was a responsibility there. And, uh, and he talked about, oh, we, we auditioned and not enough people came and peop there was also the time there was other Asian plays, it was a weird year, it was an anomaly. Other theaters were doing Asian plays, so the pool was really, there wasn't enough in, in the pool to, to cast everything. Um, and this is the Children's Theater, which has a $13 million budget, where they bring directors, and they, Mai was there, they, you know, they, uh, last uh, year um, with their show. They have resources to go to New York um, to find actors. There are actors out there. Um, so that, those were the, the, the reasons that they did, but, and, and the craziest thing is the, the, the white person that they ended up casting as the male lead, um, they got from New York. <laughs> so they haven't done anything like that since. Um, but we also had a, a forum then. We had a talk for the community to come and have a, a conversation about this and why that's happening. Okay, another fun story. Uh, <laughs> uh, in 2013, it was a Jan. Uh, actually, we uh, Rick was also the artistic director at this time, but I was going to take. I was already going to take over the following year. But um, the Ordway, which is a 17 million dollar organization in um, St. Paul, uh, we found out like you know in December or, or when they announced their season that they were going to be doing Miss Saigon. Um, and, uh, and when we saw that season announcement, Rick and I looked at each other and said, oh, crap, you know. 
and it was gonna it was going to um, open September, which is when I started my tenure as artistic director. So Rick was laughing. Um, <laughs> Like, good luck with that. Uh, here are the keys, I'm out. Um, and so uh, uh, we didn't hear anything from, from the Ordway. They made the decision, it was on there, it was already on their season. And then we get a call in January saying, uh, from their development person, saying, um, we think that w we have Miss Saigon on, we'd love to talk to you and ha get your consultation on what we should do around a community engagement around this. Um, backstory, 22 years earlier, the Ordway produced Miss Saigon and to a huge protest from the Asian American activist in the Twin Cities, artist, activist. Um, it was during the Asian American Renaissance um, that, that Rick was part of. Uh, and then, so they had a huge protest then. They, they brought it back two years later to another huge protest. This is the third time they've brought this, this play to, to us, and, so, and we're wondering how they're gonna avoid the protests and asking us what they should do. Um, well, we said, well, can you not do it? <laughs> That's a really easy way to avoid protest. Just don't do it. Uh, no, we're, you know, Cameron Mack, there's a lot of money, there's money, no, we can't do it. We've committed, uh, so I go, can you, can you cast it all Asian? Uh, or something, change, can we, can, there, the, the playwright is alive, can he change it? And make it, <laughs> maybe she doesn't kill herself, you know, maybe uh, there's, maybe the, the, there's not, there's not a, all prostitutes uh, in that there's other something. The playwright's still alive. Oh no, we, uh, we can't. Uh, so what are you here, what are you asking us for? Yeah. How, to, how to save face? Yeah. You know, it's, it's damage control. And so that we put our face out there and, say, and saying, oh, you got the, the stamp of approval from Moo. What do you want from us? <laughs> so we didn't do anything and we said we don't want to be associated with anything. And uh, we actually created our own conversations um, that we led um, around that. Three thanks to uh, counsel from David Henry Wong and uh, Ralph Pena at, at MAI, who, who found that those conversations were very effective, and in fact, they were. And from that, uh, a coalition started called the Don't, Miss I Don't Buy Miss Saigon Coalition, which is an activist group um, that's still very strong today. Uh, and the third, uh, this, uh, this is a happier story, this next one. Um, Oh, Rick was approached um, by a Skylark, an opera place, to produce um, the Mikado, or to partner to do the Mikado. And that was our reaction, too. I see some faces out there. And I was like, Rick, this is a, this is a bad, I was an associate at, at Moo doing, outre uh, doing um, a community liaison. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I almost fell out of my seat when the guy asked me. I, but then I had to explain to him, um, do you know there's this kind of, triumvirate of evil productions, The King and I, The <laughs> Mikado, you know, and, Miss and, um, and Miss Saigon, and, and uh, but it's a reflection of something, how it is not even on the radar, because when I asked him, why did you ask us to collaborate with you? He said, um, you have the costumes, oh, and you have the, you know, and I said, oh, okay. But, but I've learned to hold my fire in a lot of ways. And so uh, I said, can I talk to you tomorrow or something? Let me think about that. And then things happen. I'm actually just talking for Rick. I'm, uh, uh, I'm his, uh, but, uh, but Rick, Rick said, I think we're, there's a way we can do this. And I was like, oh, I'm so interested in what that might be. And uh, he proposed to change the script. Um, and he said it in Victorian England. Uh, and and change the he changed uh, the mention of Mikado to His Majesty, he uh, he changed lyrics to the songs, changed it to England, changed the names of the characters instead of Yum Yum, which is a f horrible <laughs> name. He changed it, he changed it to Tum Tum, because she makes our hearts go Tum 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 Tum. <laughs> so we took it out of of Japan completely and said it, uh, all the costumes were Victorian costumes. And the play 
was, and then on top of that, he cast lead actors, and he didn't even need to do this, but he cast the lead parts with Asian actors. Um, so I played uh, Coco, or the, is that his name? Oh, Coleman Co, yeah. Uh, and uh, so that, that to me, and it, it didn't have to do that, but now we could do this play, and it was really funny, it worked, it was great, and, and no one was offended, and, and we were empowered, and everything happened. You were just willing to, to do that and say, okay, change it. If you're, if you're worried about it, that, that it's racist, it probably is racist. <laughs> so either don't do it or change it. Um, and uh, so that, that to me uh, is, is a story that, that, that they, everyone learned. Everyone in that collaboration learned. And the community, they're happy. They have a Mikado they can do now, um, with or without us. So uh, there are ways of, of, of dealing with this. You just have to, I don't know, care, I guess. <laughs> Um, so Rick asked me to talk about something that happened in Philadelphia, since we're all in Philadelphia. Um, last spring, a production of Julius Caesar directed, actually by my mentor, um, Charles McMahon, opened at the Lantern Theater. Um, some background, um, I have AD'd at the Lantern several times. Um, I have ASM'd at the Lantern. When I came back to Philadelphia, um, saying, hi, Mom, I want to do art. Can I move back in? Um, <laughs> Um, Charles and his associate director um, went out to lunch with me, and they're people who have really um, been part of my journey into theater. Um, in his director's note, Charles explained that he felt that the play could reflect any place and any period of time, that he, he loved the universality of this play, but that he kept being drawn to the world of feudal Japan. Um, the sort of oopsie daisies moment um, in the story is that um, the Lantern ended up producing a feudal Japan inspired Caesar with um, no Asians in the cast on the design team or um, represented in general, um, which was a painful experience. Um, so I actually heard about this when an email went out um, saying, hey, some people, including some people from the Lantern, would like to have a discussion about this. Um, do you have any interest in helping create a discussion? And I was like, I love every single person who's involved in this discussion. Um, my mentor is part of this discussion and people who have been really influential with me uh, questioning and, and discovering my identity are part of this discussion. Um, I also just want to say that um, Melody from Asian Arts Initiative was also um, incredibly important to bringing about this conversation, um, and I really appreciate her work and um, really led a lot of this, even though I'm the one sitting here right now. Um, so we set up two conversations. Um, the first was um, a bunch of performing artists in the area, um, just so we could kind of suss out what were we feeling and what did we want to say? And then we um, had a second conversation um, with Charles. Oh wow, this sounds really different when I actually hear the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can you still hear me? Okay. Um, so we, we did have, um, so during, during this, um, Makoto, who you guys saw perform yesterday, um, wrote an open letter to the Lantern that um, I think the best way to phrase it is made the internet go haywire. Um, so we're having this conversation and um, the internet is sort of doing what the internet does um, in various comment threads. Um, and we don't have a huge amount of time so um, instead of going into as much of what happened in the meeting, I actually want to talk about some of the comment threads that came out of that were sort of happening at the same time as these meetings. Um, the Philadelphia Magazine, um, because all you need to do is write the word racist into a title and you get readership, um, <laughs> wrote an article called Japanese Actor Calls Lantern Theater's Julius Caesar Racist. And the comment threads exploded and one of the ones that caught my eye 
which I think really sums up so much of why we had this meeting and a lot of the feelings, is that um, a critic who was um, commenting stated that Asian actors simply don't exist here. Um, he may not have actually used the word simply, I may have just added that according to my notes. Um, and I, I do want to say that this was in a, in a, in a larger context. The um, comment thread is 26 pages long, so you're welcome to go read it. I actually found it a fascinating read, um, <laughs> if troubling. Um, he does acknowledge in the, in, the, in the comment threads that there are two Asian American performers. Um, I believe he was referring to Justin and B, um, but he does not name them by name. Um, he goes on to say that he sees, as, as, a, um, as a critic, he has seen many productions in Philadelphia every year and that he doesn't see Asian American actors and um, doesn't really see them in college productions either. And I think what really hurt about this was that um, inevitably that left a lot of people out. For example, Makoto, whose letter he was responding to, um, was left out of his assessment, um, who you saw perform yesterday. Um, he also left out many of the actors that you guys have seen at this conference, um, and all these people that I've gotten to meet and work with in the last year. Um, so what this really was saying to me is that when we let ourselves, when we don't, when we let ourselves, there's this sort of self-perpetuating cycle that we let ourselves believe that these people don't exist, that these actors do not exist, and so we do not cast them, and then we say, well, we don't see them, so therefore they do not exist, so then we, and it creates invisibility. And I think that part of the reason that this, and this is, this is me, this is how, what I'm learning, and, and part of what I feel like I learned from this experience, um, that part of what makes that hurt so much in theater is that theater, what I love about theater is that it helps us process the world. It helps us reflect the world. It gives us a chance to question the world or see ourselves reflected or um, experience things maybe that we haven't experienced or, or find connection with things that we don't recognize. And so to have entire groups of people missing from that dynamic, missing from that dialogue. It, it isn't just to me that we are missing seeing faces. To me, it's that we're missing experiences, that we're missing stories, and that, um, and that a group of people that I'm still struggling to understand my identity with, um, that our stories then begin to not exist. Um, and this is something that um, I also saw in the comments thread um, that I didn't put in my notes, but um, as, uh, you very kindly said, oh, I, I hope that makes it into what you say. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we talk about a lot in these comment threads especially, which are just a fascinating, just a fascinating greed, um, is this idea of offense. Um, and, and one of the people in the comment threads was saying, um, you know, people have the right to be offended by whatever. Um, and I actually was just looking through, looking for that, and there was another line about, oh, people are so offended by this and that. And I, I think that we forget sometimes that offense is about hurt, that it's not necessarily just about having the right to be offended. Um, and it's something that I've really been grappling with, and I, I, my assumption is that I, I'm still learning and that there are a lot of thoughts about all of this and there are so many people who have spent so much more time thinking about these issues um, who probably have more wonderful things to say so I really hope that you know please talk to me about it and talk to each other about it um, but I think that for me what's been so important in learning about these conversations and being part of these conversations is that it is it is part of a larger conversation about how do we how are we good to each other and kind to each other, and how do we acknowledge the hurt that we are always capable of rendering on each other, and how do we make decisions about how to reduce our probability of hurting each other. Um, I think I 
can end there for now. That, that made me think of a couple of things. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, I think one of the reasons why we are seeing this uh, outcry against things like the Mikado and Miss Saigon and, and all of that stuff, um, you know, uh, Thoroughly Modern Millie, a couple of high school productions were canceled as well very recently, um, is that people are tired of seeing the same um, images of Asians again and again. You know, and it's, it's what you were saying about invisibility. Our invisibility actually reinforces those negative stereotypes. And when you don't, you know, I was having a conversation with um, the casting director at the Roundabout, actually, and, and, and he was saying, well, you know, you know, I'm from the South, and Southern guys are, are, are you know, are stereotyped all the time as well. You know, like we're, we're always, you know, the Southern accent is sort of the hick accent and the uneducated accent. And um, what I wanted to impress upon him was that that's true, absolutely. You know, white people have their diversity issues as well. You know, and they, that's why they're part of this conversation and, and why we, we need to get them as allies in order to, to make change. Um, however, you know, you might see those stereotypes, but then you go see a Tennessee Williams play, you know, and you're like, oh, wow, Southerners are so poetic and they're so elegant and the way they speak is so great. Or you see an episode of Dallas on TV or, you know, like there are, there are lots of different, you know, and uh, representations of different manifestations of white people. And for many reasons, Asians are only allowed to be seen one way. And, um, you know, for, for instance, you know, the coolies and Anything Goes and Thoroughly Modern Millie, there actually were real, you know, Chinese people that came over and spoke with an accent and had pigtails. And, and, they, and, and there's nothing wrong, per se, with a saying them in a three-dimensional way. And that story could be worth telling. But uh, I think people are just sick and tired of seeing, you know, those same images of Asians as, as, as the only images that are out there. And, um, and along those same lines, I think it's really important to note that there was, there was a New York Times article, actually, um, when, our, when, our, when the APAC stats were, were last released. Um, and if you had read that article, you would have thought, you know, the problems of Asian actors were solved, you know, because the, the King and I was coming back to Broadway, and Miss Saigon was going to come back to Broadway, and, um, and, and while it's true that the numbers are rising, and, and there are, those, those productions do allow for more opportunities for us to perform and thrive and, and sustain a career. Um, it's really interesting that there are so few Asian American stories that are being produced in mainstream theater. You know, I know so many fantastic Asian writers and the Mai Writers Lab, you know, is the largest, you know, writers uh, lab of its kind for Asian, actor, for Asian writers uh, in the country. So many fantastic playwrights who are not able to get produced. And, and so there's a link here between, um, you know, uh, playwrights and writers as well as uh, all artists, you know, directors behind the table as well, um, that, uh, that, that in many ways the stories that are being told, even Here Lies Love, it's a story that takes place in the Philippines, or, um, you know, MTC is going to be producing a fantastic play by Francis Cowhig, but it's about chi uh, Chinese people in China, you know, and so constantly uh, Asian actors are, are being asked to perpetuate in many ways the image of us as the perpetual foreigner. And, um, and that reinforces uh, this othering process that I was talking about. And um, in many ways, I don't think things are going, going to change until we're able to be seen as, you know, the fully three-dimensional, uh, complicated, you know, beings that we are. Um, Americans that we are as par and as part of the, the fabric and landscape of the American of American society um, we're nearing the end but I just want to say a, a couple things I just have a few points that I wanted to uh, mention um, one is um, I do want to give credit to the Skylark artistic director because even after he told me about the costumes 
when I countered with the uh, proposal that we, the, we do it a different way, they were open to that. And once we got rolling on that, they were completely on board. And so what I realized is not that the person, this person is a racist that's sitting across from me. It's that the idea of Asian American is not even on their radar yet. And so then that they're not against us, they just don't know we exist in that sense, except in their concept of how we exist. And so I w he was very open to, to working together, and it was a great working relationship. I do want to mention that it was Skylark Opera, which is an opera company, rather than a GNS, a G Gilbert and Sullivan group, which who are, in a sense, not even thinking about us. And so what happened in Seattle, our good friends in Seattle, um, with the Mikado recently, where it was on N uh, the NBC News and all this stuff, because it was a GNS company, and they're basically in their own world. And so they have their own idea of who Asians are in the Mikado, and they simply don't even think about asking Asian Americans about that. Um, the other thing is, um, I do want to mention, um, and, and this is, again, one of those good stories, is that uh, Charles McMahon, who is the uh, artistic director of the Lantern Theater that, that uh, um, um, Sarah was talking about, is actually now a part of an, an initiative to support and develop Asian American theater in Philadelphia. And that blew my mind. So, so there's that kind of opportunity for people who don't necessarily think about us or it at the time, but are willing to then make an adjustment, willing then to, the, to discover something uh, uh, that is just not here. And, and, and in that sense, uh, I feel like there's opportunity. And then uh, a third thing is just that uh, B, No, and Justin, who are the two act Asian American actors in the, uh, uh, Philadelphia, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but actually no longer, just those two or those three, um, have, st have started a group called PAPA, uh, my dad, no, PAPA, um, Philadelphia Asian Performing Artists, and uh, that's hugely exciting because that's going to be the beginning of something very big here. But uh, so just with that, I just want to open it up. We only have a few minutes left, but but uh, um, yes. Um, we need you need to be recorded. Even though the Mikado in Seattle was what got the national attention, because uh, you, but it's a really really small tiny company that does one show a year in Seattle. I want to just highlight what I want to encourage people to do, building on what Rick just said is that one of the things that we've long done in Seattle with a lot of other companies where originally they, they call us up and they're, they're saying, you know, we're thinking of casting this you know, lead actor in this show that's about like a Korean folk tale, um, and this is like the sixth largest theater in Washington State, um, and, uh, but we're gonna cast them white. Uh, what do you think about that? And we have these conversations with them, and they ended up casting all Asian, and it was great and giving op opportunity, and other shows where there's like 20 some Asian American actors working with them long in advance in the casting process, sometimes a year in advance, to make sure that there's actors ready for the roles, working with artistic directors of um, leading theaters where they're willing to actually offer acting classes even for actors if they need a large pool of actors, and there's some actors who just need a little bit more experience. Um, working with uh, training studios um, to offer diversity scholarships and how to help select that. But one of the things I really want to encourage is as leaders in each of our communities, rather than waiting for these theaters to come to us with these questions and using those opportunities, it's great when we do that. Um, and rather than waiting until something blows up in our faces, the Mikado was something that was just weird because they're such a small company that they're not even on most people's radar in Seattle, to be honest. Um, but is what I, one of the things that um, uh, Roger and I do over the years is we look at what co companies, when they're about to announce their seasons, or especially when they're just thinking about their seasons, and even in advance of them deciding what their seasons are, actually setting up meetings with different artistic directors going, have you looked at this play, um, um, and figuring out strategizing with them well in advance of that. So it's making those meetings, like what Randy was saying and what Rick was saying, um, where you make the meetings ahead of time, before they even announced seasons, before they even started casting, and working with them to try to educate and create awareness about the opportunities of non-traditional casting. Um, and then the other thing I just want to say is a lot of playwrights in CL, um, we have a lot of writers groups, and a lot of them who are non-people of color, um, they have started writing in their uh, 
character persona list, um, this world should reflect the real world. Therefore, all the actors should not be white, or they should reflect, you know, uh, age and diversity of ethnicity and race, and, and, and we're encouraging more and more playwrights to kind of put that out there, and that's actually gotten more directors to think, oh, I never even thought about that, but that's what's opening up the non-traditional casting in Seattle. Can I just add one comment on, on that, uh, that, that work, I mean, if you have the energy and the time to look at what everyone else is doing and to go in to talk to them about it, God bless you. <laughs> I don't have that time. I don't, I shouldn't be their educator. I shouldn't be the police. That's not why I came into the arts. That's not why I'm in the arts. So if there are people who want to do that, that's awesome. Um, but as a, as a producer of, of, of a theater company, I'm, I'm concerned about the community and making sure that the Asian American community in, in where I live is represented well. And, uh, and I, I don't, I, I, although I can't be the police, um, I don't think I should be. Uh, they should figure out that. In the meantime, I'm gonna focus on telling stories, untold stories um, that, uh, that need to that need to be seen and heard. Uh, just uh, a footnote to Kathy, actually, um, and, and on the importance of being vigilant, and I know it's weary sometimes to constantly protest or to constantly be the police sometimes. I think, again, in this ecosystem, some of us want to take on that role, and others, we all have to find our place in it, and so do what you do best, right? Uh, but in terms of uh, a footnote to the Seattle situation, while that company is, yes, a small company, at the same time, there was a convention of Gilbert and Sullivan uh, uh, companies who then have said, listen, this has gotten national press, it's gotten on NBC, we have to stand up and pay attention. And so it then is partly on us, yes, to be vigilant because there is this attention and to constantly say if there are more of these productions, wait a minute, you guys saw what happened in Seattle. I thought you were all talking to each other. You know, so I think we all have to continue to do our part, but people are paying attention. Uh, I'm just gonna add that I think um, uh, in Seattle there's somebody um, uh, in the community said, yes, um, when they go to her for uh, help in casting a show, they'll say, yes, I'll help you, but it, you know, I wanna make sure that you keep on thinking about this, not for the, the you know, this uh, particular role in, uh, that's for a black person, but thinking about casting black actors in your other shows that don't specifically call for uh, actors. And I think that, apply, that could apply to us just as well for Asian actors. We had that follow-up conversation with the Gilbert and Sullivan Society when they came. Okay, we want help uh, if we ever do the Mikado again. Uh, <laughs> and and so I had an honest conversation because they honestly thought we cast the best actors, so no Asian American actors came. And they said, well, if you're going to do outreach in terms of Asian American actors, have you thought about? I you need to do it for all of your Gilbert and Sullivan shows. It should not just be for the Mikado. And we should have a separate conversation about the Mikado specifically, and they are actually open and they're doing that with the, the um, protest group. Okay. Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Francesca and I'm based in New Orleans and so I just feel like I wanna put a little bit into the conversation for everyone about Asian Americans in the South or in communities where there isn't a flourishing Asian American you know, um, community, and I, I think oftentimes I find myself in this hard rock, what is that, I don't know, you know, hard place, <laughs> where it's like, I don't wanna be the only person educating people that this is incorrect. And I also recognize that I have a responsibility as someone in the community to say something if no one else is. And, you know, having, we just had a production of Cuckoo's Nest in New Orleans where the Native American chief was played by a white man and no one seemed to have a problem with it and I was the only one crying in, you know, in the hallway and it, and, and it makes me think, what if there's an Asian character in these spaces and what does that mean? And I have allies within the community but they're not Asian American, right? So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel the same. So what do you do in those, I'm curious about what people do in those communities. You know, we, we actually have had a couple of instances where, where people have written us at, at APAC 
about these things that are happening on a national lev uh, level. And uh, what we have is a, is a do better letter that we send to these theaters. Um, and uh, it, it really does help, one, to have another group um, that, um, that, that, that is, is showing them that, that the, what they're doing is actually getting, you know, the, it, it, it's being flagged by other organizations that are outside of the New Orleans area, for instance, that it could, it could result in, you know, uh, brand reputational damage or reputational damage to their brand and, um, you know, that, that there's this larger uh, organizations out there that it's not just a bunch of, you know, actors who are complaining or, you know, just you who, who sees this. Because it, it certainly, uh, it, it, it's one of those things where um, I think people don't pay attention until uh, it seems like there's a, there's a, there's a groundswell of, of support behind, um, you know, behind that. Just briefly, too, we haven't really talked about dramaturgy or included scenic designers much, or, or, or all of our designers around diversity and inclusion. We want to make sure that behind the scenes in the production of the plays, we're also advocating for them as well. Um, one other thing that came up in a conversation around diversity and inclusion recently with that uh, I had with a, a major consultant in the field is critics. The critics that come to see our, and, and critique our plays are usually through the lens, very much a white lens. And so um, we were recently uh, reviewed at Ours at Play, and the person honestly did not understand the dynamic of the immigrant experience, the Korean immigrant experience. It was very clear in the way they articulated their critique. And it's not to say that they have their point of view and we learn from it, but then we I've, I've seen it where all of our patrons come and they absolutely relate. So I'm challenging us to also encourage our writers in the, in the API community to think about going in to being reviewers so that we start to get points of view in the critiques out to the greater public as well through, that, through our lens and, and, and POC critics in general. I didn't want Randy to get it because he has a whole dissertation on critics. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you want to learn more about that. Uh, but last question because we're running out of time, please. Yeah, yes. Or last comment. Yes, it's both really. Uh, my name's Jonathan. I'm from London. And I just want to say a big thank you uh, because uh, um, it's more this ecosystem you mentioned. It's not just uh, national. It's also international. I mean, with the, uh, the orphanage out, what happens, which in a nutshell, uh, one of China's greatest plays cast all whites with... Uh, two Chinese actors working on a dog puppet and a half Japanese actress who looks white playing the maid. Uh, it, was, it was in our, in our national press and conversations, the fact that Asian Americans did write in, did support, um, you know, made a really big difference that people, the uh, uh, eyes uh, there were looking on it, really. And so I think that, you know, there's, there's um, so that's very helpful. And, and I have to th really thank Kata, um, you know, uh, and uh, Jeff and Juliet, and Asian Arts Initiative and Gail for facilitating myself to be able to come and you know be at Qatar uh, this year. Um, and I say that, but I would say there's a word of caution. There's all these diversity training initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. You can get caught in the training trap. The RSC and the National Theatre in the UK, who have millions and millions of pounds of from the government um, and have you know hundreds of people in their acting company, they've ran all these workshops to meet lots of actors over the past year, but, and yet no one's been employed. They've had all these meetings with the directors and promising this, that, and the other, and none, no one's been employed. Uh, you know, so, you know, and all these meetings happen and, oof, before the end of March, which is the uh, our financial year, so then they can say they've met us, <laughs> sign off the love, you know, right into the, the funder, and they get the money for talking to people instead of getting money for actually employing people. So I'd be cautious to put in, you know, employment quotas, not just training quotas, just one thought. The second thought is that, you know, choose your battles. Randy's really right, you know. We've got to choose the battles we've got to fight. Obviously, you know, communicate with our allies. So I myself this year have just got onto the West End Producer Training Course, so I'm now considered an emerging West End producer or new producer, and I don't know whether I could pursue that or not. But that allows me to have, that's probably the battle I'm choosing, to allow me to have the conversations with those people and their counterparts in Broadway, which I'm hoping to do in about four weeks' time. 
and to have that product available. It's funny you mentioned uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. I think an Asian-American version of that, something I've been touting for quite a long time, and various Shakespeare's, et cetera, that are you know, a much more Asian or Asian-American based. I have, a, I have a track record of doing that. And it's, you've got, but you've got to partner that. Most actors I know, Asian descent, want to work with, I hate to say this, with white directors, and I've had conversations with people here, quite a few. You know, and so if you, you know, I don't want to fuck your a Asian, um, um, who's a very Virginia Woolf. I'd rather be, you know, the spear carrier in, you know, whatever, you know. If you against that background, I, you know, maybe everyone has to choose their battles. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the panel. Please give them. <laughs> and thank you all. And I'm going to hand it over to Gail again. Take you. Just, yeah, thank you so much to the panel and to all of you for being part of this discussion. Um, just a couple of um, other additional opportunities to continue the conversation. Um, I know um, some of you are aware that the third floor of this building is set up as a cafe style hangout space. Um, and so for those of you who aren't um, already sort of scheduled to go to too many panels or um, readings, um, if you want a chance to be able to you know, sort of catch up with other individuals in, or in small groups, um, we invite you to use that space however you, however you need. Um, 